Well, again, let me just say what a, really, it's truly a privilege to me. I just look so forward to Chamber Fest, and um, why that is, is you students really motivate me and uh, want me to keep serving better uh, Jesus. So thank you for that and the opportunity to share with you. Uh, in just a moment, we will turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. But before we do that, let me just explain where we're headed in uh, the chapel times this week. I'm calling our Bible teaching for this week, Daniel, for Discipleship Today. And that, of course, deserves a, a wee bit of defense, at least some explanation. Why Daniel and discipleship in particular? For one, the Jewish Talmudic scholars from the third century, Christian era, understood the book of Daniel as providing for this sort of discipling treatment. Oh, they, they didn't have the term discipling, but they treated it as a catechism for faithfulness to God. Second, the canon of the Hebrew Bible places the book of Daniel not in the prophets as our Protestant versions do, but in the writings, which lends to an argument for discipleship purposes of Daniel. And third, the first Christian commentators namely Hippolytus in 170, Christian era, Origen in 185, and Jerome in 331, all understand Daniel as promoting an example of what they term <coughs> radical discipleship. Via the key themes in Daniel of faithfulness to God, wisdom, piety, holiness, courage, and of course, discipline, from which we get the term disciple, a learner who is so committed to learn that they go through serious discipline. One of the reasons I love speaking to you all is I think musicians learn discipline, or they should. <laughs> you will this week, I know for sure. And so it ties in so nicely with a life of discipling. One scholar refers to Daniel as all about what he calls a lifestyle for diaspora. Diaspora meaning living authentically Christianly when you are pushed out into a challenging and sometimes threatening world. Diaspora, sent out through culture or oppression or persecution or whatever causes one to be part of a diaspora movement. And so I want to turn to Daniel in terms of discipleship for today because I really want to un unabashedly challenge you, wonderful Chamber Fest students, to embrace not mediocre discipleship, not laissez-faire Christianity, not status quo, Jesus following, but radical discipleship for a diaspora lifestyle. Because I think in the West, Europe, and certainly North America, we are more and more living in an exilic kind of condition, and we need to be serious about discipleship. 
Discipleship that embraces these Daniel-like qualities of faithfulness, wisdom, piety, courage, and discipline. Those are the godly qualities I think I can voice for the faculty and staff, the counselors, all of us here at Chehi Summer School of Music unabashedly say we hope to foster in you and in ourselves. So now let's turn to our passage to introduce this, uh, not at the very beginning of Daniel, but we certainly could do that, but for today, chapter 5, verses 11, 1 to 12. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, in order that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him. And his hip joints <coughs> went slack and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me will be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, his face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. But a woman has an answer. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father illumination, insight, wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and the solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now, call for Daniel. Now, Daniel be summoned. And he will declare the interpretation. Musicians, of course, cannot read this amazing account without hearing the, the resounding harmonies of William Walton's cantata Belshazzar's feast reverberating in their ears, especially for trombone players with the beginning trombone proclamation that opens the entire piece like a trumpet call, but with the deeper, more sonorous, better sound <laughs> of the trombone announcement. <laughs> 
three trombones in unison on a middle B flat, loud and bold and commanding. It's every trombone player's dream because it sounds glorious it's an, and it's incredibly easy. <laughs> <laughs> For Walton, we know that it was a fanciful and mythical story, intriguing and even illuminating for consideration in the world today. But in the Bible, I want to suggest that this is perhaps the centerpiece of what I would like to refer to as exilic discipleship, diaspora life style faithfulness, discipline in spiritual formation. As Daniel is clearly set in the context of exile under the excruciating realities of Babylonian hegemony power, domination, within which we find this supreme example of lifetime, lifespan <clears throat> obedience to God. Well, first I want us to consider how discipleship is, in fact, actually uh, demonstrated in this account both literally and in terms of a vocation as a calling for those who show radical loyalty to God. And it comes out in the conclusion of our passage, verse 12, with an actual call on the lips of the queen, directly translating the, this portion of Daniel is in Aramaic, the Aramaic text, now call for Daniel. But Daniel now be summoned. Literally in the Aramaic, now Daniel be called forth. It is, of course, not only interesting, but more so essential to see in this account that long and faithful discipleship bears fruit in the most pragmatic of ways, when an actual call is issued. And the one outsider, the one who has made his mark on the basis of fidelity to the one living and true God, none of the other men of wisdom, none of the other diviners, none of the other Chaldean scholars, but this one, outside, is literally called for. Call for Daniel, cries the queen. I want to suggest to you young ladies and men, and all of us, who is called for? Who is trusted? Who is turn to in dire times is a marker of the fruit of the history of someone who has been faithful. Faithfulness that finally eventually sinks in and makes an impact to even world leaders. We should not fail to grapple with the story's irony that in all the realm of Babylonian cultural hubris, its pride and its arrogance, there is none other up to the challenge of understanding God and his ways and his purpose. And thus the queen's cry, call for Daniel, is at once shocking and stunning and absolutely right. Who do you call for is a measure of discipleship. But beyond the obviously literal call that is voiced by the queen, 
we must see behind it a long and serious vocational aspect to this calling, which defines it in terms of faith-based discipleship that even makes the literal call a potential possibility. And this is not just an assumption behind the story, kind of like reading between the lines, but it is actually written into the Hebrew or Aramaic grammar of this text. And to understand this, I'm going to have to take just a moment to be very uh, purposefully technical. But that's why I love speaking to you. I can get away with that because you're bright and smart and intelligent. And uh, you'll understand this. I think after I explain it a wee bit, it'll prove worth the time and effort. In verse 12, <clears throat> when the queen aggressively suggests in the Aramaic, it's quite an aggressive, loud statement, call for Daniel, you idiots, more or less is what she's saying. It is in a Hebraic form that is really, really important. It's in a Hebraic form that serves both to intensify and specify the verb that's used. It's called the hithpaya. Here, yithkare is the word imperfect hithpael that is relatively rare, the Hithpael form, because it is defining an action as causative and reflexive, which means then that it is both purposeful and reflects back on the subject, in this case, Daniel himself. So that it must be that the reason the biblical authors decided to use a hithpael form here is so as to communicate to us something of the vocational sense of calling behind Daniel here that he himself had a lot to do with. That is his reputation based on discipleship in a godly direction that he was the causative subject behind it and that obviously now also reflects back on who he is, what he has become, someone who is called forth in dire times. Such a reputation that the queen remembers well. There is a man. The queen's insightful suggestion and cry, call for Daniel, you see, is both literal and also evocative of the whole of Daniel's life that has been deliberately formed, that is discipled, that is disciplined for godly purposes. I want to really urge you that I think when we talk about discipleship in Christian circles, we, we have a lot of different things floating around in our heads. What in the world does that mean? Daniel, amongst other sides to discipleship, teaches us we're talking about disciplined life for God's purposes. Discipleship requires discipline. It's not just meeting with your pal over a coffee and chatting away and having a little prayer. It's very, very disciplined. It includes fasting and prayer and solitude and study and hard work so as to be faithful to God. 
It's only to be expected then, and thus in some ways natural, to note how this account then goes on to give such prominence to a triad of discipleship goals. In this passage, I want to propose to you is a triad that involves character formation as well as skill development as well as supernatural enabling as it relates to this calling of God, Daniel. That is, in other words, that such character formation and skill acquisition and the inclusion of elements that are clearly supernatural are not incidental in this story, nor are they peripheral, nor are they any way coincidental, but rather they are forged in the very crucible of Daniel's deliberate discipled lifestyle, his, what I call his Hithpael background. <laughs> the causation, the purpose, and the reflection that formed who he was that we were talking about just a moment ago. And again, it is the queen who gives this voice in verses 11 and 12. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. That this was because an extraordinary spirit. I really want to see in years ahead that you are defined an extraordinary spirit. I want so much to aim at that identity that Graham spoke about last night. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. You cannot help but note in this biblical description the inclusion of evaluative terms that are clearly all about character and others that are focusing on skill and yet again others that hearken to the reality of the supernatural. For example, the very first description of Daniel in verse 11 <coughs> references him as a man in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And then the same sort of allusion is offered at the outset of verse 12 that similarly describes him as possessing an extraordinary spirit. Ruchach yetera in the Aramaic portion of Daniel here. Very strong language, an extraordinary spirit. Spirit. What does he mean by extraordinary? The language of the queen, of course, is best her best take from a non-Jewish perspective and mode of expression as saying there is a supernatural side to what this man brings to the table. And virtually all scholars, what is this term extraordinary spirit referred to? they all understand it to be indicative of an extraordinary ability that can only be accounted to God. Supernatural involvement in your life. But there are also clear examples, aren't there, in this list of skills, namely insight, illumination, Explanation of enigmas, solving of difficult problems, interpretation of dreams. And whereas both wisdom and knowledge in Hebraic Aramaic culture are always associated with overall character. So what certainly without question is critical for us to note is actually twofold. One, 
is that it is clear that the discipleship school that eventuated in the calling forth of Daniel produced the necessary and healthy relationship that we could easily reference as the natural, supernatural mix. There ought to be a mix of the natural and the supernatural in serious, disciplined, God-focused life. And two is that it is also clear that the discipleship school that eventuated in this calling forth of Daniel produced the necessary and healthy relationship that we could easily reference as the character skill mix. The natural supernatural mix, the character <coughs> skill mix. And I want to suggest that if we are interested in discipleship via Daniel for today, both of these are absolutely necessary for Christians, young and old, to be effective, particularly when we are more and more living in this reality of exilic-like experiences. Let me say as clear as I can, for you as ardent musicians, and even more as ardent Christians, skill and character have to mix it up. You cannot excuse <clears throat> lack of skill with just a good character, but neither can you focus so exclusively on skill development and yet have no character. Some of the most proficient people involved in the arts, so skillful, but there's no character to match it. God-focused discipleship puts them together. Chehi puts them together. We are as interested in the character development of who you are as in your skill on an instrument. And likewise, for you as ardent musicians, even more as ardent Christians, I think there has to be such a renewal of the mix of natural abilities with supernatural power. We need the power of God supernaturally to be an extraordinary spirit defined as an ability that can only be accounted for because God has intervened. All of that is what prepares you for the calling of God, both literally as the queen's voice rings out, call for Daniel, and in terms of a lifetime vocation, so that the key themes of Daniel, faithfulness to God, wisdom, piety, courage, and discipline make up the story of your life, my life. That is to say that you become an example of radical discipleship. We just don't need mediocre disciples. We really don't need laissez-faire Christians. We need radical, disciplined followers of Jesus. There's so much more in this opening look at Daniel, these first verses. We're going to come back to this very passage tomorrow. Jesus, thank you so much for this time, and I pray for these students and the coaching that's going to happen in the next hours. Bless them. I pray you give the faculty and all of us with the immense privilege, counselors, staff, the immense privilege of having a part in shaping these dear men and women, that we would combine skill development, 
with character. That our time with them would enhance both of those. And that the natural abilities would be combined with the enabling that only can be from you, supernatural power. Thank you so much for this incredible book of Daniel that we'll have the privilege of exploring. Give everyone a great day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.